Okay, so we'll just get cracking. Uh, I'm Kirk McNally from the University of Victoria. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, to uh, frame this, give a little bit of background, this paper is uh, part of a larger research project that has just received funding for two years. I'm grateful for the financial support from the Social Sciences and Humanities, Humanities Research Council of Canada. And I'm very happy to have Dr. Paul Thompson, um, Toby Say, uh, Dr. Brecht Mann as collaborators on this larger project. We're looking forward to sharing the outputs of this work with you at future conferences. A goal of this larger project um, is to explore how there is explore how notable uh, creative moments within the production of music recording can be identified, critically evaluated, and correlated to measurable features of the resultant audio recordings. The publications that I'm going to list now are those that form the foundation of the project. Um, there's one on reverb. There is one. Um, there is one on kick drum and uh, kick and snare drum sounds. So these are electronic sounds. Um, and then there is one on the use of multi-track archives in higher education. It's this previous work that has raised some of the questions that I'm trying to deal or answer, um, partially answer today in the presentation today. If I'm remembering it correctly, uh, the keywords on the grant application were sound recording, audio archives, audio analysis, and pedagogy. Um, and I think you'll see how these themes, even if I'm not discussing them explicitly today, run throughout the work. Okay, so moving to our motivation for the specific work of this paper. Um, it largely centered around what I had identified as a lack of materials. My work with audio archives particularly those that uh, included multiple takes and outtakes of songs had proved very useful for educational purposes. And I wanted to extend this, um, or extend these materials to include a more complete record of the session activity. These new materials would focus on um, the recording situation, uh, as opposed to the mixing, so strictly in the recording situation, and should include the engineering decisions that were made before the tape was rolling. So in that set of time, while you're finding out your sounds and things like that. Um, from my previous work with uh, kick and snare drum samples, which obviously are, uh, I mentioned they were electronic, so they don't include some of the secondary information that's present in acoustic recordings. Um, so isolation considerations, uh, like those, those sort of factors. So there was a need to test the analysis techniques that we had used previously with these new live acoustic recordings. There was also what, um, or I, I felt there was a need for a framework and theory to evaluate the activity that was captured during the recording session. Um, and specifically, this would be used to identify when and how technical decisions were being made and the point and the purpose of these decisions. So looking to answer the question, why behind some of the engineering and production choices. And this is, again, specific to that uh, recording situation. So this is where I'm turning to Michel Chion's work on modes of listening as a point of departure. And I'm scaling these down for the specific case of the recording studio. And I'll speak more about that in a minute. So the work plan and methodology, um, I conducted, or we conducted, Paul and myself conducted a recording session with the band Ben Sinister, uh, Vancouver band Ben Sinister at the Warehouse Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, this session used multiple uh, cameras and a time of day multi-track recording. Um, so this is where I took a split directly from the desk output. So everything that was going to the tape was going 24-7, well, not 24-7, whatever it was, 24-10. Um, <laughs> uh, that's wrong as well. Anyway. For the entire session. Uh, and also including the two mixed output of what was being monitored in the control room. So I had a complete record of both what I was listening to and what was actually running through the board, whether I was listening to it or not. Um, okay, so that's the first piece of it. Second piece was because this was going to only provide um, a single case, I required a larger number of songs in order to test the analysis methods. So here's where I turned to the open multi track test bed. Um, which is a fantastic data set if you're not aware of it. Um, and from that, I selected nine songs, and the mixes of those songs done by, um, well, I guess it was nine different engineers, which resulted in 62 different mixes for me to look at. This provided the opportunity to evaluate how these different engineers treated the same individual source sounds within a number of different musical contexts or songs. What I was looking for was places where the engineers 
converged or diverged in their treatment of the source tracks, and specifically the amount of variation that was present in that treatment. Um, okay, so for the final piece, uh, we had to kind of test this uh, framework in theory to evaluate the activity that was captured during the reporting session, and again, this is where I'm using Michelle Shion's writing, um, and specifically the concept of modes of listening. Um, so a brief discussion of that theory will follow, uh, but I will say that I'm using this as a point of departure. Um, and this is very much this point of the work is a work in progress. So any feedback that you have on that is greatly appreciated. Um, so, so welcome. Okay, so quickly to Michelle Shion's work. Um, probably better to uh, attribute this to Pierre Schiffer, who Shion studied and uh, worked with and has adopted a large part of his thinking, but the, the principle is the same. So um, I'm gonna just quote these directly from Shield's writing. Um, they're, they're his version of them, but the three modes that we're gonna be looking at are causal listening, reduced listening, and semantic listening. Causal listening, uh, you've probably had a chance to read it there. Um, this is the kind of one-to-one -one thing when there's a bang, what made the bang? Uh, that's your first consideration. It's not what's the quality of that bang. It's like, where did that bang come from? Um, so you can think of the equivalents within the recording studio. Um, do I have my patching right, or are my mics going to the right place? Some of these direct one-to-one. -one. Is there a buzz on that? Where is it coming from? Those sort of questions. Then we move to reduced listening, and um, I'll just let you read it there. But uh, this is the kind of rarefied or specialized mode of listening where we, where we are um, thinking about the qualities of the sound alone. So cause goes away and we're listening specifically to the sonic attributes of that sound. Semantic listening, the last one, um, is again the, the, the easy equivalent is um, language. And Shion extends that to interpret um, like Morse code and things like this. Um, the point that I want to focus on here is this last line. A phoneme is listened to not strictly for its acoustical properties, but as part of an entire system of oppositions and differences. So if we take the phoneme uh, K, so linguistic would parse language into phonemes and K being one of them, when we have that used in the word kill, it means one thing when it's used in skill. Um, it means something else, and it becomes what's before and what's after it. Uh, irregardless of the fact that the K sounds different, we understand it to form the same, um, it, it functions a role of the K, but it sounds different, and it means something different. Okay, so that's where I'm headed. You'll see where that's why that's important, and I'm focusing on it. Um, further to my use of Xion over, um, over Schaeffer, or, 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 is that He's also written a fair bit on the use of sound in film. And I think this is particularly important when you're considering the audiovisual record that I'm going to be showing you in a minute. Um, this differentiates, obviously differentiates his approach from Schiffer. Um, I think, I believe it's in the introduction to the, into Shion's text, uh, where the, the person writing the introduction um, says that the edges around the theory are a little bit more ragged. Uh, and he's a bit more accepting of sound's purpose or meaning within different contexts, and that is where I sort of latched onto it and took it. Um, and that was what well, that was the attraction for me. Um, the two modes, not so interested in the causal one. I think that's fairly uh, straightforward. Um, I am more interested in focusing on um, semantic listening and reduced listening, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate through the Ben Sinister report. So you're going to hear in a minute. I think the concept of reduced listening makes sense within the context of audio engineering. It's something that we all sort of feel like we are good at, hopefully. Um, it's those times in the studio, and I'm, this is my words now, I, it's those times in the studio where we focus on correcting the sound, um, removing resonances, dealing with stereo image, micing uh, considerations, isolation considerations, all of these things. I would also include the enhancing of the sound with this, but it's separate from its function within the broader context. So you can think of the sort of the, the absolute question being, does it match what I'm hearing in the room? That sort of, just put the boundaries on it there, okay? Um, with regards to semantic listening, I'm equating to this, or I'm equating this to how we understand the individual musical element to work within the larger concepts. So the first, so this is where the scaling idea comes in. How does it work within the song, and then how does that song work within a given genre? And you can sort of scale it out from there. Uh, this is both musical and technically, uh, or musically and technically, excuse me. 
anything like that. So just as with language, we all understand that to be a kick drum. Um, but there, we, that can be interpreted as right or wrong, both technically or musically, depending upon the context. This is the case where the engineer attempts to enhance, or sorry, so when I'm saying semantic listening, this is the case where the engineer attempts to enhance the sound beyond strictly reproduction and extends it in some way such that it takes on greater meaning. Um, thinking about our production timeline, um, what we are doing here at this stage, the recording engineer needs to communicate both the technical and musical language to both the band and to potentially the mix engineer. So in the, specific, in, in the case that I am drawing on in the analysis that's following, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to look at. How well was that communicated? Okay, so to get into that, um, again, I'm looking at the question of how well it was communicated and understood and studying the variation in the treatment for the same source tracks for kick and snare drums. The measures I used here, I sort of cherry picked a couple measures. These have been proven um, useful in my previous work again with kick and snare drums, sample sounds, uh, and they were mel frequency substrate coefficients, which is which represents just largely represents um, the signal spectrum with a very few coefficients and spectral centroid, which is uh, basically the center of mass of the spectrum. So it's where the maximum amount of energy lies. So. Um, if this was a single snare drum, and we see some variation with regards to frequency, which makes sense, snare drums are tuned differently. But if all of the engineers had treated that exactly the same, this would be a single line. Right? There would be no variation present. So we can see that across these nine different songs, there is uh, and the outliers being the blue, not alone, and the far right, right on time, where there's significant amount of variation present in their, in their treatment. Okay. Um, if we look at the same for the pick drums, we see that the general sort of median is lower, which is to be expected. The drums don't have as much variation with regards to tonal center. Um, but there's clearly one song here, the high blood pressure, that was not well understood, either musically or technically, by the mix engineers. And there's a great amount of variation present in the treatment of that. So um, I guess I should back up for one second. I analyzed the original, and then I analyzed all of the mix, and then did the comparison between those two. So that's where I'm getting these numbers from. Um, and that's spectral centroid that we're looking at there. That's one measure. If we move to the um, MFCCs, and these are, they, they look like frequencies, and you can kind of think of them, it works, it works like that, but it's not exactly what they are. Um, but for our purposes, it's fine. Um, We'll see that there is some variation, again, because we're seeing some variation in the, high, in the higher band numbers because of those songs being placed at different points, or pitched at different points. Uh, but we see maximum variation in band number three, which is a, a thumbs up, that's good. Um, it's even better when we look at the kick drum because that directly correlates and corroborates the finding previous uh, in my previous work where we can actually characterize the the characteristic of a kick drum um, by using band two. It's significant enough that you can actually characterize the quality of a kick drum by that band. And certainly to uh, distinguish it from um, a snare drum. So they're at different bands, so that worked. <laughs> the measure is valid. Um, okay. Uh, so the variation in this one obviously um, suggests that they, that they weren't, weren't completely understood, and that's to be expected. Um, but certainly some were different than others. So if it was just those nine engineers, and they all had sort of uh, the same variation, we would have seen the same sort of standard deviation between all songs. Clearly, there's a couple that stand out. So they were, th this is the ones that I'm trying to kind of get some more insight into. And that's where we're heading to the um, audio video analysis from the Ben Sinister sections. Um, and I'm, basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to break that down using the Xion theory and then um, doing the same analysis on them and sort of doing a comparison to, this, to these results. So that's, that's the path we're on. That's the band um, that came into the studio. We did three days. And I'm just going to play the video with a little bit of a intro. Uh, again, this was, so basic setup was there. We were now at this point, we're sort of tweaking the sounds before. We were working on um, the first song, so it was within that context. Um, but this is the first sort of second of any EQ dynamics compression of that, but miking decisions had been made by this point. Okay, so here we go.
it's good. I yeah. just need to I just need to do this. Yeah, no, I quite, I quite like it with that. Thing. Okay, then a little bit in context if I could, yeah? I'm uh, sorry, just a little bit of the snare in context. So to just, not that, to just break that down, um, you hear, well, maybe you didn't hear, but I said, uh, I just need to do this, so I've already made a sort of statement of qualitative statement. Um, I say, it's good, I just need to do this. Uh, so that was where I was detailing the snare envelope through the use of compression. Uh, listening, you were listening to the two mix, so I was cutting between the two mix and the GoPro video there. Um, equate that to that reduced listening state where you're focusing just on the quality of the sound. Um, but I had a defined goal, right? There was some meaning between, I, I just need to do this implies there was some meaning. Again, of course, like Alex said, but I was the engineer here, so I'm kind of you know, reading, reading, I don't think I'm reading too much into it. It's what I try to do with this name. Lengthen the sound a little bit musically, so using the compression to provide a little bit more length, so bringing up the decay. Um, then I asked for a little bit of that snare context. The sound is checked for technical and musical qualities within the song. This again would be what I state or think of as the semantic listening um, state. And then there's another round of uh, the process is basically repeated. There's another layer of equalization added. And then at the very end, the, the two mix balance is adjusted to check that snare decision within a more accurate final reference of the song. Um, and so that's a cycle of that reduced and semantic listening. I'm calling it scaling, I guess you could call it a cycle. Um, that would also work. Uh, two things of note here, I was going back and looking at the video, uh, I was genuinely surprised to hear the rest of the band start playing when I asked for the snare in context, and this points towards that sort of focused listening state. It was actually quite surprising to hear them come in, I don't remember them doing that. Um, and I think that shows because of the balance, and then it's like, oh right, they're there, and you push them up at the end. Um, it's also interesting to note that there's a tacit understanding between Paul and myself, about that second layer of EQ that comes on. Um, it may be that I'm just not very eloquent, but um, I can't quite mutter out what I'm, what I'm doing, when, when Creed, what are you doing? Um, but either by looking or by intuition, we both sort of knew that it required, I certainly was going for the high frequencies, and that was what Paul then says, oh yes, you're adding a little bit of the high frequencies. And it's actually before, if you know the desk, it was before I was actually working on that EQ knob. Um, so I think that, again, that sort of speaks to that kind of language that is present, that we're, that, that we're trying to communicate to the next person in the production timeline. Uh, to look at the analysis of this one, uh, so what I've done here is I took the mean, well, I took, because I only have one, um, I took the 
snare drum of Ben Sinister and apply the same MSCC analysis. As the spectral centroid doesn't make sense because you need other people to mix it to see if it varies. Otherwise, it would just be a straight line, so it's meaningless. Um, but this is meaningful. Uh, so that's the dark blue line is the is the sort of trend line for the Ben Sinister. Uh, not alone is the low, so that's the one that showed the most variation within the mixes. And in the meantime, the red solid line um, was the one that showed the least variation. So you can see that they're uh, not as, with regards to this one feature, it's not as bad as the, the one that showed the maximum variation. And it's not in the same place as the other. It's a little bit meaningless, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but it's a little bit meaningless until the song has been mixed a bunch of times. And once that has happened, then there's a better um, analysis to see what the actual variation was. Same process for the kick drum. I've sort of time-lapsed this one a little bit uh, to speed it up, but um, same, same principle. So principally it's the same sort of process, but using a different technique to create um, uh, musical meaning, again, um, but using just a different technical tool. Um, corrective equalization, I think this, you, you'll see the same sort of pattern, and you saw the same sort of pattern. It was done in isolation, then it was done within the context of the mix. Then another layer was added, checked, and then referenced within the full context of the song. Um, if, the speakers would do a better job. It, the fundamental frequency is being boosted there. That's the process that I'm doing. Uh, that, again, provides a little bit more um, musical length and moves it away from being a sort of uh, older sort of sounding uh, kick drum. So there's, that's where I'm saying there's some language implied by the technical decisions. Um, I'll just skip to the graph here. Same process, so uh, the Ben Sinister one and then the uh, high blood pressure was in the dotted line again was the one that showed the most variation and the red one was the one that showed the least variation in the larger mix group. Um, and you can see that the, the pattern is somewhat the same. Um, this time I'm on the low side of, the, of what that was interpreted as good within that context. Okay, great. So. Conclusions. Need more data. Uh, need to send off these pen sensor recordings with different mix engineers so that within this larger sort of study, um, they'll be meaningful. Uh, there's also a need to expand, expand the analysis to include a few more features and make that a little bit more robust because when you cherry pick like this, it's easy to find um, correlations that may not be there. They may, uh, you need just a broader set. So we'll be working on that. And what I do see is there's value in using this framework in theory to evaluate the audio-visual record. Um, it allows me um, to break down the processes that were happening um, because you do have a ton of data to work with. So uh, that provides a, a, a clear sort of insight into what was being done. But then you can go and look at the technical elements. Um, and this would work equally well for the music uh, decisions that were made later within the session. Um, but what it really requires is more sessions of the same process, and then you can do uh, that, that sort of uh, analysis between those three. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's what I have. Thank you very much, and uh, any questions or comments? Is it going to be a commercial release of one of these? 
songs or the whole. That, the those are remakes of uh, recently released commercial ones. So they're on about eight albums in. Uh, so they've released them. They came in, did this, and they put it out. They actually filmed uh, one of the songs and put it out just on YouTube. But they're using it as kind of like social media filler. So not an official release. Yeah. So you said you had there was nine mix engineers on this project you were analyzing. Did I get that right? Correct. Yeah, on okay. the larger data set. Yeah. Yeah. Did all the engineers have the same music genre background and the same amount of experience? So all of those, so those nine mix engineers were uh, done in a previous study at Yale University. Um, they all came through that program. They do not have the same background, and there has been some work to see what the influence of background on their mixes is. Um, they were asked to use the exact same portfolio of tools. Okay. So they had the same source, same tools. They had their own individual background, but they were going through the same school right. process. So the variable could be their choice, their, their musical choice, what they're, what they're into. So that could be, it could, that could but be the way they affected those extreme frequencies, like the, the super low frequencies could be a, low, a slower track, for example. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's all of those potentials. Um, what it does point to is that it's not consistent. What has been studied is those same, that same test set. Um, the engineers have been studied across the nine different songs individually and looked at the variation in their treatment versus the global set. And those engineers will be more um, regular with their treatments than the whole set. So this kind of, it, it, it connects the dots a little bit around that that's not just, uh, there's something a bit more to it. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.